As I mentioned at the end of the last video, I'm going to try to prove to you that our elected officials in this country cannot afford to be ideologues. And before we get to that, what I need to do is just have a general conversation about what ideologies we find in the United States. Because remember when we talked about an ideology, it was an organized, consistent set of beliefs, values, and opinions we used to make decisions. Now, as we look at the United States and as we listen to political scientists and, you know, these television reporters and such talk, we throw around a lot of terms. And some terms that we hear a lot in this country are conservative, liberal, and sometimes we will hear the phrase libertarian. Those are probably the three most common ideologies that we find in the United States. They're not the only ideologies we have, but these are the three most common. Now, as we talk the rest of this chapter and as we go further into the semester and talking about different topics, I'm going to start using these terms conservative and liberal quite a bit. And what I need you to realize is that we as Americans can sometimes make generalizations about these ideologies. And we use terms interchangeably sometimes when it comes to these ideologies. For example, conservatives, a lot of times we will say an individual that is conservative is on the right. And we don't mean by they are correct. They are on the right side of the political spectrum. Conservatives tend to be Republicans. These three words can generally be used interchangeably, but not always. So keep in mind that when we're talking conservative, we're generally talking about somebody who is a Republican, and they tend to be to the right side of the political spectrum. Liberals, on the other hand, we will generally use the word liberal or to the left or Democrat interchangeably. And then libertarian, we will generally just say libertarians belong to the Libertarian Party. Make sure that you understand how these words can be used interchangeably, conservative, Republican, or right, liberal, left, or Democrat. Because as we're watching the news, as we're watching coverage of the, of the election that's coming up, the media will sometimes say, oh, well, he's on the left side of that issue, or he's to the right of center. That's the same as saying he's a Republican if he's right side of the center, or if he's on the left side of an issue, that means in most cases he's a Democrat. But we have to be careful not to become too exclusive with the use of the words conservative or liberal. Because when we look at certain issues, we'll find out that some Republicans will be on the liberal side of an issue, or some Democrats will be on the conservative side of an issue. And two examples. There is a group of Republicans known as log cabin Republicans. And these log cabin Republicans are Republicans who are socially liberal on the issue of homosexuality. These log cabin Republicans believe that we should recognize the rights of gay Americans, which is not a conservative issue. It's not a stance that most Republicans take. And now on the other hand, you will have some conservative Democrats. There are Democrats that are pro-life. And again, most Democrats are not pro-life. Pro-life is not a liberal issue. So we have to be very careful not to be exclusive in the use of these words, but realize that the interchangeability of these words, conservative right and Republican, liberal left and Democrat, are generalizations. We're going to take a, a closer look at what it means to be a conservative and what it means to be a liberal here in just a little bit. Continuing our discussion about ideologies and ideologues, a lot of times we will talk about the U.S. political spectrum. And what that means is that there are people that fall on the very conservative side of things and people who fall on the very liberal side of things and there's people who fall in the middle. So we can very clearly say that people's political beliefs in this country span the spectrum. And a lot of times the way political scientists will demonstrate that is by using what we call a bell curve. 
you'll see on the screen. It's not a perfect bell curve, but it is a representation of a bell curve. And what a bell curve is used for is to show the distribution or the normal distribution of most naturally occurring events. If we use this bell curve to demonstrate what Americans believe ideologically, we'll basically see that people to the left of the center of this bell curve are generally liberal or Democrats. And people to the right of the center on this bell curve are generally conservative or Republicans. The bell curve, or this normal distribution model, is very useful to show how American ideologies are spread out across the country. Because, when, again, when you use the normal distribution or the bell curve, any time you measure a naturally occurring phenomenon, the graph of that is going to look like a bell curve. So in other words, if, if I pick any naturally occurring phenomena and I measure every instance of that occurrence, and then I were to plot it on a graph, my graph would look like this bell curve. For example, if I was to weigh every student at Southeast Missouri State University, you would find that a very small number of them are very skinny, a very small number of them are really heavy, but the vast majority of the students at Southeast Missouri State University are kind of average weight. They're what we say one standard deviation from the middle of the bell curve. If we were to go on top of Academic Hall and drop a thousand golf balls off the top of Academic Hall, and then we would measure how far those golf balls traveled from the building, a very small number of them would travel a relatively long distance. A very small number of them would have traveled a very short distance. But the vast majority of those golf balls would have traveled an average different distance from the building. Now, with the same concept in mind, if we were to figure out how to measure the ideology of Americans, which they've done, and we assign each American a number, and we were to plot those numbers on a graph, the political spectrum in the United States would look like this. A very small number of people would be very, very liberal. A small number of people would be very, very conservative. But most Americans' ideological beliefs are in the center. They're moderate. This is an important concept to understand. Because if we realize that the average American's ideology is not extremely liberal or extremely conservative, rather it's kind of moderate in the middle, then we should be able to understand the statement that I made earlier that elected officials cannot be ideologues. Because if we look at the political spectrum, as we show on the screen here, you got the Democrats to the left of center, the Republicans to the right of center. And you will find out that most Americans fall right kind of in that middle of the bell curve. And since most Americans fall in that bell, in that center part of the curve, most politicians are going to fall in that part. Because the way politicians get elected is by appealing to the most Americans they can. And how does a politician appeal to the most Americans, the most voters that he or she can? By staying as close to the center or the middle of the road as possible. Because if you look at this bell curve, if you look at this, this spectrum on the screen, there are ideologues on the U.S. political spectrum. But they're way out to the left or they're way out to the right. And if you look at how many Americans truly are way to the left or way to the right, the number is very small. So if I'm an individual that's trying to get elected to public office, I need to be holding an ideology. I need to be you know, demonstrating beliefs that are as close to the center as possible. Because the closer I get to the center of the political spectrum, the more people that I'm going to appeal to. 
And we're not going to go over this in this class, but there is actually a mathematical theorem called the median Bode theorem that can prove mathematically, scientifically, the best way to get elected is to try and be as close to the center as possible. Because if you're very much in the center, there's going to be some of those very liberal Republicans that are also close to the center that you might be able to get to vote for you. And you're going to have some of those conservative liberals that are very close to the center that you can convince to, to vote for you. But if you're an ideologue out on either extreme, you're not going to have very many people that are going to support you. Other ideologues are going to support you, but the number of ideologues in this country are so small that it's not worthwhile for any elected official to act as an ideologue. And if we understand that most elected officials most people running for political office are trying to get as close to the center as possible. We understand why elected officials like Barack Obama and John McCain will point their finger at each other and claim that the other person is an ideologue. Because if John McCain can get very close to the center, he's going to look up and Barack Obama is going to be very close to the center as well. And what McCain has to do is he has to try and convince people moderate people in the center of the political spectrum, that Barack Obama is more extreme than him. Easiest way to do that is to point his finger at Barack Obama and say, hey, you're just a liberal ideologue. You're way out there on the extremes. You're trying to do crazy liberal things to this country. And Barack Obama's in the same boat. He has to try and explain to those people that are moderate, middle-of-the-road Americans that John McCain is much different than me. He's a conservative ideologue. He's wanting to do all kinds of crazy things to this country. When in reality, average Democratic candidate for president and the average Republican candidate for president are as close to the center they possibly can get. There's not a huge difference between them. There's differences between them on some major issues, but on most issues, a Republican presidential candidate is going to sound very much like a Democratic presidential candidate because they're trying to get as close to the center so they can appeal to the most people possible. And the easiest way to make yourself look more moderate is by making your opponent look more extreme. And that's why we throw around this negative phrase, ideologue. I made a statement a few minutes ago that some of you may have picked up on and some of you may not have. I said that there's not a huge difference between the average Republican candidate for president and the average Democratic candidate for president. I have had students come back to me after taking my class and they've said, you know, Mr. Sexton, I really disagreed with your statement that, you know, there's no difference between Democrats and Republicans. Because, you know, look at the Democrats, they're, they're pro-choice, and, and they're pro-homosexual rights, and they're pro-welfare. And then look at the Republicans, and they're, they're, they're pro-life, and, and they're, you know, pro-marriage, and they're, they're, you know, opposed to welfare. They're more in favor of, you know, people getting out and earning their own way and doing those types of things. Now, you've got to realize that that's on the big issues. When we look at the average Democrat and the average Republican in this country, especially those that are running for president, you will find that there's really not major differences on 99 point something percent of the issues. On most issues, Democrats and Republicans agree on the issues that are necessary to run this country. As a matter of fact, and you've got to listen very closely to what I'm going to say, because this can confuse some people. When we look at American political parties, or we look at the American ideologies, just about every political party in this country, just about every ideology in this country, is what we would call a classic liberal ideology. 
And we have to be careful here because we as Americans sometimes, oftentimes, tend to look at things only through American eyes. For example, if I was to ask the average student in this class who the best football team in the world was at this point, most of my students are going to say it's the New York Giants because they just won the Super Bowl. But if I was to ask some of my foreign students what the best football team in the world was, they're going to say, obviously, it's Manchester United. And the confusion here comes down to the word football. We as Americans think of football as the New York Giants, the, you know, the Philadelphia Eagles, that oblong ball that you throw and pass up and down the field. Whereas most people in the world, when they think of football, they think of the game soccer. So this relates to our conversation because when the average American thinks of liberal, they think of Democrats. But if we were to use the word liberal in the rest of the world, they would not think American Democratic Party. If I was to ask the average European what a liberal party was, they would say, well, any party in the United States would be considered liberal. Because the American definition of liberal and the classic definition of liberal are different things. And this is important to understand because if you understand what classic liberalism is, you will understand and you should agree with my statement I made earlier that there's not huge differences between Democrats and Republicans in this country. And let me try and, and demonstrate that to you. Classic liberalism is a philosophy that was created in response to the fact that for most of our history, people were born into whatever station in life they were going to stay. In other words, for most of our history, you were either born a member of the royal royalty or you were a member of the peasantry. And if you were born royalty, you were always royalty and you were treated better than if you were born a peasant. What you could do as an individual meant very little. And the only real way to get out of the peasantry or become treated better than an average peasant was to get involved in religion. And as a peasant, the government, whether it was the government of the Catholic Church or the government of the royal family or the royalty, those two governments told the peasants what to do all the time. And there were a group of philosophers who looked at that situation and said that we shouldn't determine the worth or the significance of an individual by looking at their heredity, their lineage, or the fact that they were a member of the church. Classic liberal philosophers say we should empower the individual. We should determine whether an individual has self-worth or not based on what that individual can do himself. And the second thing that classic liberalism says is that government should stay out of the lives of individual citizens as much as possible. Empower the individual and keep government out of the lives of individuals as much as possible. That's what classic liberalism says. Now, I want you to picture Barack Obama and John McCain standing in front of the classroom right now, and you asking both of those men, which one of you two believes in empowering the individual? Both of them would raise their hand and say, I think we should empower the individual. Which of those two men standing in front of the classroom would say government should be involved in the life of the average citizen as little as possible? Both men would raise their hand and say government should stay out of the lives of individuals as much as possible. 
So if the Republican candidate for president and the Democratic candidate for president are both saying or both stating that they believe the key points of classic liberalism, doesn't that make both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party in this country liberal parties? If we use this classic definition of liberalism, which is the oldest definition of liberalism in the world, if we were to use classic liberal definition, American parties are classically liberal. Now, I am not saying that there are absolutely no differences between Democrats and Republicans. There are differences. And the differences between a Republican and a Democrat, or I'm sorry, a conservative and a modern American liberal, is found in how each of those two parties or ideologies attempt to empower the individual. Or the difference between those two ideologies or parties is what part of government or what part of an individual's life should government be involved in and which ones shouldn't they be involved in. So understand what I mean when I say there are not huge differences between the American ideologies or the major American political parties. They both believe in classic liberalism. But to understand the difference between a Republican and a Democrat, you have to look at how the Republicans think we should empower the individual and how the Democrats think we should empower the individual. And you have to look at what areas of life do, you, do conservatives think the government needs to be involved in? And then you have to look at those areas of life that the Democrats or liberals think government needs to be involved in. And let's take a really quick look at the difference between modern day American conservatism and modern American liberalism. Modern day American conservatives believe that government should not be deeply involved in economic decisions. Modern conservatives believe in the free market. The government should stay out of my economic life. They should stay out of my wallet. Modern conservatives believe that government should be involved in clarifying societal positions on moral issues, on abortion, stem cell, the right to die, homosexual marriage. So if we were going to summarize it, modern conservatives, American conservatives say, stay out of my economic life, but I think government should be involved in the moral, societal issues in my life. Now, liberals are just the opposite. Modern American liberals say that government should not be involved in societal, moral, or ethical issues. We, as individuals, should be able to determine our moral boundaries without government being involved there. But modern American liberals say government should be involved in economic things. Modern American liberals believe that the government should redistribute wealth in certain ways to try and equalize economic outcomes. Modern American liberals believe that we should empower individuals by providing societal programs and government-sponsored programs to help the low income and those types of people in this country. We should empower them by giving them programs to help them come out of poverty. Modern day conservatives, on the other hand, say that our government should empower the individual not by giving them societal or governmental programs, but, but by teaching them to fend for themselves. When we look at modern day conservatism and modern day liberalism, both of those positions, both of those ideologies want to empower the individual and keep government out of our lives as much as possible. 
but one believed the government should be involved in one part of our lives and not the other. And one of those ideologies believed that we should empower the individual by providing government programs, and the other one believes providing government programs does not empower the individual. It makes them more dependent on the government. You can believe either one of those. I'm not going to tell you which of those two are, are, are correct. But I want you to understand the difference between modern American liberalism and modern American conservatism. And understand that both American conservatives and American liberals, both of those groups meet the general definition of a classic liberal party.